And then finally, we have Amin Rafi from BitNation. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I want to cover the aspect of governance in. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I want to cover the aspect of uh, governance in terms of the blockchain, and I guess uh, you know the topic today is distributed public ledger. I mean, with distributed ledger. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that you know there's a big, big difference between a distributed ledger and a distributed public ledger, um, a decentralized blockchain and a private blockchain that I guess hasn't been mentioned and one of the biggest aspects I can refer to is if you compare Microsoft to Linux, um, you have a privatized operating system and an open source uh, operating system and in most cases you'll find out that the power of the blockchain and distributed ledger comes from its uh, transparent and open to all aspects. Um, the power that gives it from having millions of people looking after it instead of, you know, a few hundred from a company is a massive difference. Um, so to bring it back, I guess, from a re refugee's perspective, um, a lot of them face difficulties when opening up, I guess, uh, they need access to financial uh, institutions, which is very hard given that they don't have an ID system or they're not in the system to have an ID. Um, what Bitcoin actually allows you to do, or, you know, you may choose another uh, cryptocurrency, is that you can bypass that. So you can get a Bitcoin debit card that allows you to instantly have access to money. It can be sent to you from anywhere in the world. It's agnostic of the location. And, you know, you don't, you don't have to go through all the fees and the hassles of, you know, for example, if you do Western Union, you still need an ID. If you do MoneyGram, you still need an ID. Um, so you actually bypass these difficulties that the banking institutions, um, you know, they haven't been able to kind of uh, get around to. So we're starting to see a movement from relying on institutions and private core uh, entities to people helping out other people and not needing to discuss the situation with the middleman. I think this is a great step forward. For example, there's been numerous cases of donations being sent directly to the people that need it in a village or in a tribe or wherever it may be, or even cities for that matter. And, you know, bypassing the charity organizations that are along the way that take a lot of fees for the institution for printing stuff or uh, paying the salaries to people, members that help out. So you can cut out the middleman and I guess that's the bigger message of blockchain and Bitcoin in itself is that you remove the middleman and the middleman seems to be carrying a lot of the fees in our society in specific. And if you remove that, you allow uh, freedom of flow and freedom of flow in terms of money, whether it's information or anything else. And I think that's one of the greatest aspects. Um, the other part is, you know, with BitNation, we're trying to uh, implement an ID system. So providing people using the European uh, laws and standards an ID and identification that is not provided by the state. And the legality of this is self-determination. And I'm sure a lot of you, if you are aware or if not, you can look into it is what gives the state its own power as well. So using the same concept, we can uh, allow people to choose their own uh, legal system, they can choose their own uh, code of ethics or whatever it may be, and providing with the physical ID. And we're trying to implement that and use it within the Schengen area and trial that. Um, other aspects is, you know, the refugee support that we had. Again, you know, moving away from relying on institutional or government entities to people helping out people. So we have the we had an open source, well, we're still up, but I guess it's used less now that the uh, attention has been uh, decreased. But we had an open source map that, you know, anyone from anywhere within the EU could log in and just like uh, spot locations that may be dangerous for refugees to travel across, minefields, um, weather locations, it could be Bitcoin embassy, so they could go there, learn about it, maybe get in touch with someone that could help them out with a Bitcoin debit card to have access to some sort of a money. Uh, we also implement, a, as someone mentioned before, a basic income system. So obviously not the same thing, but just in a different branch of it. And this allows you to grab donations, or grab money that's uh, being put forward and equally distributed between all the members in the network. And I think this is a much better approach than, you know, 
what we attempted to do at the moment. Moving on from there, um, you know, you can look at shared economies and things like that as well, and how much they benefit. I mean, in Netherlands, uh, you know, they have people that invite uh, refugees to your home. You can have dinner with them. They stay at your place. You help them out. Couch surfing has been a great help of this. I mean, if you compare this com uh, typical system to, you know, the p putting them in a camp or something like that, I guess. I guess that's the big message, you know, if you return it back to the people, people can help out other people. And if you remove the middleman, we can find a solution that may be much more beneficial to them than just, uh, you know, looking at them as a problem. Um, the other aspect uh, that someone else also mentioned is the monopoly pro provided by privatization or singularity of a blockchain or putting everything into the one system. And I guess that's another aspect that blockchain uh, and distributed uh, ledger really helps to remove. And that is that, you know, you can't have ownership of the entire economy. If people have a say of who they choose. And I guess in terms of cryptocurrencies and digital currencies, it allows people to choose what they like rather than being able to choose the national currency or the European Union currency, for example. And this completely changes things. So you can have on a local level uh, currencies that are made for people to trade within a community. And they don't need to rely on any other form of, uh, I guess, input or regulations from the outside world. And they actually did this in a, plain in, a place in Spain where they have their own currency and they deal with everything within that system. So it allows individuality, it allows expression of, uh, a, you know, philosophical perspective or whatever it may be, political sp perspective. Um, the challenges we have seen along the way that are uh, common are identity. So online identity is a huge uh, w uh, I guess stepping stone of reputation systems. I read somewhere that the European Union is looking forward to introducing uh, identification systems for personnel and using them for social media aspects so to regulate reviews paced by people and to allow a much more controlled uh, uh, direction when people are doing things online so it links back to their ID system. I think that's a terrible approach in my personal perspective because uh, you know in one hand you do get the good but it's just Again, this is my personal opinion. I think I think it can be done in a much better way um, than allowing you to connect your actual identity to your online identity and you know losing your privacy along the way. So that's just uh, another aspect. And as, as the other gentleman mentioned, uh, I think it's great that we have decentralization in terms of uh, Uber, Airbnb. I mean, the only reason Uber was meant, uh, was uh, allowed to be removed from many nations was because it was a private entity. I mean, if you had that on a decentralized network, it would be much harder. I mean, you, it would almost be impossible, you know. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to go over those different aspects. And yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, please address them. And yeah, thank you to IDNEX for allowing me to take their place here, actually. They were supposed to speak for Robert. So thank you.